Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Hi. My name is Dr. Wando Anyoku. I'm uh, Executive Medical Director of Swedish Pediatrics. And I am so thankful that you're able to be with us today. Um, today, I'm joined by Dr. Thakar and Dr. Obi, who are two of our phenomenal pediatricians at Swedish. And we're going to talk today about back to school. This is typically back to school time for everyone. It's traditionally a fun and exciting time full of possibilities and thoughts of the next year. This year is a little bit different because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we're getting a lot of questions from parents and from families about how best to manage getting their kids back to school and managing their household. What do they do about in-person versus remote learning? And so today we want to talk about, you know, some of our insights and ideas and the, the thoughts that we, we share with our patients. And we hope that you'll find them valuable. Um, as a housekeeping item, please enter any questions you have into the comment section and we will do our best to address them during this time. Um, we've had so many changes this year, this 2020. There's just been so much going on with this pandemic. And as the school year is getting started, it seems to have come to a head and parents are just not quite sure how to move forward. And so I'll share, I'll start by sharing my one big um, insight to everyone is to take a deep breath, to take a deep breath and know that we're gonna be okay. Um, this time is different. We're going to learn differently. We're going to learn different things, but we're gonna be okay. So let's take a deep breath. Let's enjoy our children. Let's enjoy the school year. Um, that's my big message to everyone. Um, and I'll start by turning it over to Dr. Obi. Um, perhaps you can introduce yourself and share some of your insights. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the intro, Wando. That's uh, perfect. I think we really do need to take some time to, you know, just appreciate where we are right now. Um, my name is Dr. Obi, uh, Dr. Tinanyalam Obi. I am a pediatrician at Swedish. I work at both the Snoqualmie and the Redmond campuses at this time. Um, and uh, I've also seen some babies at Issaquah, so I'm very thankful to uh, be a part of this uh, back to school broadcast for you guys today. What do you think, what are you hearing the most, Dr. Obi? And what is your number one takeaway that you're sharing with parents now? Oh my goodness. So the number one is really just uh, wed the new with the routine. So uh, right now we're getting so much new information about what's going on with COVID and uh, whether kids are big vectors, whether they're not big vectors, whether schools should be open, should not be open, that sort of thing. Um, but I think I like to remind parents that, you know, medicine, even though it is very dynamic, is that it's a lot of times rooted in things that we already know. So I like to encourage parents to make sure that their kids are well vaccinated. So if they need to get those routine routine uh, vaccines, that they go ahead and do that. Uh, if they need their well child visits to get those scheduled. Um, for schools, uh, making sure that if their kids do need extra resources, that they go ahead and get those IEPs and those 504 plans um, for their kiddos in place, especially uh, the therapies if uh, kids need them. So it's very important to counter the things that we're hearing that are very, very new with the things that we've already known for, for ages, so. Thank you. Dr. Thakar, mm. how about um, you share with us, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and, and your top insights. Absolutely, thanks for having me this afternoon. I'm Dr. Ruben Thakar. I am uh, practicing primary care pediatrics at the Edmonds site for Swedish. And I am also the immediate past president of the Washington chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm delighted to join you all today. What are you hearing, Dr. Sakar, from your group, from your patients? Well, you know, I first want to echo what uh, Dr. Obi said that I think it's so important right now for kids to still uh, get their well exams, the vaccinations. I think we're getting a lot of calls from families saying 
should we be coming in? Should we be staying away? And um, you know, offers a, you know, a lot of accommodations to to make things safe to come in. Um, when we're talking about vaccines, you know, it's oftentimes a back to school time to feel reminded when they're due for them. And um, it's important that we make sure that we continue to get those on the community level. The last thing we need right now is an outbreak of another serious and potentially fatal disease on top of the pandemic. And on an individual level, we want to do everything we can to keep our kids out of the emergency room in the hospital where their exposure patients would be higher than the primary care clinic. So I really urge people to, um, yes, to come into your doctor's office uh, for your, your well going your vaccines. Um, yeah, beyond that, I think the school is starting virtually. Uh, what a lot of parents are asking is, how are we going to make sure our kids still get social contact with um, other humans? How do they um, still work in that social emotional development when they're not going to be in school? And um, my answer to that is, I think it's important to create those opportunities at home. Um, you know, we know that transmission is significantly less likely outdoors, and we know that mask wearing and hand washing all makes a difference. Um, so, for example, I can share in my home, um, my daughter, we've been letting her have um, under adult supervision, have um, scooter plating. Um, with your know, friends, she is, is masked in space from them the entire time, but still getting to see friends and still getting some physical activity, which you know normally uh, she's getting recess at school, but won't be able to do now. So we have to create those opportunities at home. And um, my son has figured out that his favorite game, Battleship, can actually be played outside with a mask that's cute apart from your friend. And so that's something that he's been enjoy enjoy doing as well. So we just have to be creative in how we create those opportunities. And I, you know, kids can also communicate with uh, family, relatives. And friends too through you know platforms like FaceTime and Zoom. Um, you know, even though we try to limit screen time, I think that's something that we need to allow right now. And it also gives them practice for what it's going to be like when we do school virtually. I think you're exactly right. You know, we <laughs> there's so many things that we kind of emphasized a lot, like limiting screen time, and it turns out that this is the normal. Um, but I think I really appreciate your calling out, Dr. Thakar, all the the, well, the roundedness of what school experience is for kids. It's not just the education, but the socialization and sort of interacting with people. And so as we're solving for school remotely, we also have to solve for those other aspects of um, education remotely. Um, and, you know, it's challenging. Uh, there's, we had a question come in about older kids, you know, the older teenagers and the college bound ones, how, how do we help them without nagging them? <laughs> um, I think that, that was the, the, the thrust of the question. You know, parents of younger children are struggling with building a structure around them and giving them a certain time, but how do you deal with that for the teenagers? I have two teenagers and that's a, a challenge, um, but teenagers and college bound kids, how, how would you advise your patients, Dr. Odi? So I think it's very important to remind everyone that while we're in this together, this is also something that we have to personally take uh, responsibility for with regards to mitigating spread of the virus. So uh, with my older kiddos, what I remind them, and especially those that are college bound, is the precautions that you take for yourself are not only for you, they're for everyone in your environment. So making sure that you're hand washing, that you're um, keeping up with the guidelines that we we've already suggested from the CDC, keeping six feet of distance if you can, um, uh, sheltering in place when you should, you know, um, in the ways that you are provided that opportunity. So um, it's very important to remind them that even though uh, it doesn't seem like the virus is something very tangible, it is something that uh, what we can't see. And so making sure that they're taking care of themselves is a way to take care of everybody else around them. So reminding them of that social responsibility might be helpful. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I really appreciate what we said there about just you know, reminding teens that we're taking care of a whole community. I think we've all been in our teens and 20s and felt invincible and you know that nothing can touch us. And so we have to remember that that's a place where our young adults are coming from. But you know, while we know that uh, transmission of, of COVID-19 is less likely in younger kids, we know that for um, teens and 20s, the, the rates of transmission are as high as for our older adults. And so we do have to remind, um, remind them about that. And, you know, if school ultimately does end up, um, you know, actually back in person at some point, it's not going to be the same as what um, high schoolers or, or college students think of it. You know, things like um, contact sports or choir or band 
are still probably not going to happen this year. And, um, you know, we have to avoid sort of crowds. So things like using a walker, for example, might not be something that happens anymore this year. Um, you know, even things like lunchtime is going to be different. It, it won't be in a crowded cafeteria anymore. And so I think as, you know, um, as we get questions from our, our teenagers about what to expect for school if it does go back in the session, I think it's important to sort of lay out a little bit of groundwork too, that things are going to be a little bit different to take care of each other. Indeed, indeed. I, th I think that is so true. But, you know, that makes me think about how do we even talk to them about what their expectations are, how, how do they manage their anxiety around this time? How, you know, for parents, what should they worry about? How do you have those conversations with your children so that, to your point, we're giving them some sense of normalcy, but also some sense of agency as they're managing this new space. So how do we address that? I, you know, I try to talk through with the parents of my kiddos and with my kiddos, you know, this is a different time and let's try and keep in place the things we know, a, a structure, a time to do classwork, a time to go out and take a walk or, or bike and connect with friends and keep some of those things steady that we can and continue to be hopeful and think about the future. But how, how are you addressing that with your with your families? Yeah, you know, I think um, a lot of the conversation, I like to allow my kids to direct it, you know, so give them basic information about what's happening and, and the necessary safety information they need to know. Um, and then just, um, you know, let my kids know that I'm able to answer any questions they want to ask. And when they ask questions, I'll answer them as openly as honestly as I can, uh, but also try to make sure to keep some of you know my own baggage away. You know, so you don't want to create anxiety and fear. So you want to answer the questions directly, um, but not uh, not instill more fear. Uh, but I think anytime we put a question off and, and don't don't really take the opportunity to answer it, that can create some more anxiety. And then I think you know this is this is a time where people are experiencing um, you know lower moods because of not getting the human contact they're used to, anxiety over um, how long this pandemic is going to go on or what happens if someone in our family gets it, and I think at all ages people are experiencing that. And so as a parent, um, I think if you feel like you're concerned about your child's mood, or concerned about the anxiety level, I really encourage you to reach out to your pediatrician and ask for resources. This is not something that parents have to figure out on their own, what they're supposed to do if their child is having anxiety or depression. That's what pediatricians are there for. You know, reach out to us and, and we'll help steer you in the right direction for how to get your child those resources to, to develop some better coping skills. Thank you, Dr. Obi. Oh my goodness. I will have to say I love both of your answers so far and that Dr. Thakar talked about uh, mitigating anxiety by making sure that parents or guardians and those that are already involved in their kiddos' lives are giving um, constant check-ins to see where their kids are. I think it's very important that I've reminded some of my parents that they need to check themselves too. It's hard to address uh, anxiety or address issues ahead if they are experiencing their own uh, anxieties about it too. So making sure that those are in check first and then addressing their kiddos is very important. Also making sure that they're checking in with their own um, PCPs and adult docs, family docs and primary care doctors would be very, very important too. Um, I think it's also uh, important to check in every once in a while just to see how kiddos are doing, especially if they have friends um, who have family members that are affected by the virus or family members themselves um, that they explain and continue to give their kids updates of what's going on, uh, if appropriate. So, yeah. I love it. I, I think that the, the point of reminding, you know, remembering that they, they are part of a community, right? And so the parents and the, the caregivers and other family members are also the wellness is also important to the wellness of the children because that's a lot that they're they're trying to manage. One of the questions that we've got is how do parents, you know, manage their concerns about having the child bring the virus home? Um, and that, you know, as we have more remote learning, that's probably less of an issue, but um, at least in this particular context, but you still have them trying to go out and, and bike and be social in a little bit in, in some way. And so parents are worried about how do they deal with that? And so, you know, to the points that we made earlier, I talk about, you know, keeping up with the recommendations that we already know with masking and social distancing and, you know, keeping, keeping um, you know, hand washing, just basic public health strategy that we know about. 
um, but also being aware of each other and each other's exposure and, and possible risk factors as a family and as a, and as a unit. That's kind of the guidance that I give, but um, I'd love to hear what you guys are dealing with in, in that conversation. Dr. Thakar? I think, you know, just as you said that, you know, we know that um, wearing masks and um, distancing and hand washing and spending as much time um, outdoors, you know, when, you, when you're seeing people seeing them outdoors as possible, those are the four things that really uh, mitigate the risks. And that's what we should all be doing. And it's also really good practice. You know, if kids do end up back in school um, at some point this year, um, they're going to need practice in, in wearing masks and getting used to not touching their face all the time. You know, I can tell you, as a doctor who has to wear masks from time to time, it's still new for me to wear it all day long, all the time now, like I, like I do. And it took some getting used to for me. So I know it's going to take some getting used to for our, for our kids in, in grade school. Um, so I think, you know, having these... Um, having these, you know, supervised, distance, masked opportunities to, to still get social interactions and practice wearing a mask and, and hand washing and all that is really an important thing to do so that it becomes something that's um, that doesn't feel so awkward for kids and doesn't make it so hard for them to to keep their hands away from their face if they do end up back in school. That's okay. So um, I think one of the things that you addressed was, um, you know, the fear of possibly bringing it home or spreading it amongst family members. And as Dr. Sakar had mentioned earlier, I mean, we have seen um, uh, data to support that vectors are usually in the older adults, older teenagers, as opposed to the younger kiddos. Um, especially that we are in a setting where uh, for most uh, Washington state schools, we're going to be going online first before uh, actually integrating ourselves into an actual school building um, for the fall. It's very important that if our kids are going to interact with other kids, whether um, social outings or um, uh, recreational activities, that um, one thing that I've recommended for my families is to um, be smart about it. Um, uh, make sure that if we are going to be interacting with other families and other social groups, that this is something that we can try to space out as much as possible, um, that we aren't mixing groups um, as frequently just so that we can make sure that there is a time frame for us to see if we have developed symptoms, could we have come into somebody, into contact with somebody with COVID? That's important. Um, so I kind of liken it to um, kiddos who um, are attempting new foods at, at six months of age. Um, so you always wanna give it a little bit of time after introducing a brand new food uh, to make sure that if they are, do develop a reaction to that particular food that you know exactly what it is. Um, so I kind of encourage the same thing with uh, social groups and interactions too, um, that it isn't constant and, and persistent and consistent, it's um, a little bit more distant. So being smart about the distancing too, to add to what Dr. Sakar and um, you and Rwanda have said. Thank you. So we have a question. We have we have a question, it says, what is your take on the impact of how much screen time kids will have on uh, with virtual learning? Um, I'll have an, an eight-year-old and 11-year-old. Uh, I can totally feel the pain. Well, those are the same answers as my two kids, so maybe I'll tackle that question first. I have to do it on my own home. <laughs> um, you know, I would say as we get back into school and virtual learning, I think that we need to separate that from what we consider screen time. Um, you know, it's, pediatricians always talk to people about limiting screen time, and, and I am a strong believer in that. Um, but I also think if education for school is going to be through screens, um, you know, kids are going to see it as very unfair if we don't let them have the screen time that they're used to having. Um, and so I would think that we should separate that that education from the sort of fun screen time that they get to have, but still put limits on that fun screen time like we always would. And the other key thing is to have have breaks between screens. So if you know just finished you know three hours of Zoom, it's probably not the best time to get on that Nintendo Switch right now. Um, you want to get some outdoor activity. So still you know make sure that there's um, outdoor physical activity that's happening every day. And you know going back to what we talked about at the very the very start of this about how important schedules are, um, that's that's something that's going to be a little bit harder to do when you're at home is to have that same structured schedule that you have in a normal school day. But it's so important um, that kids and, and teens of all ages really just respond better to having structure in their day and having a schedule. And so um, 
we want to make sure that that is still there. So you sort of figure out when is that screen time going to happen, just like you would um, on a, you know, an evening or a weekend um, when your kids are going to school in person. Still want to do that while they're doing school virtually, sort of figure out when that fun screen time happens and have limits on it. Um, but don't count the don't count the Zoom meetings that they have to do for school against them. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I, I think the eight and 11 year old are just at the beginning of that project, then you just get into the older teens and it's even more of a challenge. And, and I think to your point, um, Rupin, my exact counsel is about structure and just having a schedule and having everyone know what, what the expectations are at each time. And, you know, having a way, an acknowledgement that they do have their recreational screen time, which it would be unfair to deprive them of, but then you don't want to find a situation where they are 24 hours a day on the screen. <laughs> so you want to break it up, you want to build in, you know, outdoor activity and, you know, which is a, which is a gift and which is a reward is part of how your family works it out. But I, I think you're exactly right in, in dealing with that. It's so challenging when we think about how in this new um, reality that we have to think about the things that we were concerned about differently now, but think about it as a learning opportunity because, you know, this is, we're going to be here for a minute, um, but, but I think we can totally make it work. Dr. Obi, do you have uh, a different approach or more details that you'd like to share? Oh gosh, um, I think you guys have both hit the nails on the head about you know screen time and the fact that now we have to recommend a little bit differently. And I think what you've mentioned, Wando, about expectations is important. Um, with screen time, uh, we had that expectation that we could divert ourselves from it. We could limit it to just those two hours of a day and then everything else is gonna be reading or playing with wood blocks or what have you. <laughs> um, but I think right now um, expectations of screen time is that we can experience a little bit of burnout. Um, we have experienced symptoms of headaches or our eyes hurting, things like that, um, even on a long work day. Um, so uh, making sure that we're splitting up the day, our routine is good. And then also the expectation that, um, you know, kids' attention at the beginning of the day towards their learning at home on screen time might actually change by the end of the day. Um, so uh, that might also even affect performance. So our expectations of what kids are able to do are going to also change a little bit with regards to screen time. And, and, and I don't say that to, to make anyone nervous about um, you know, online learning. I, I'm sure a lot of parents already have that anxiety, but, um, but noting that, you know, what we expect kids to do in a different setting is, is, is definitely gonna have to change for sure. And I'm hoping that the school districts and um, boards of ed education take that into consideration as well. I think that is such a, you know, a key point to call out, you know, everybody's expectations have to be recalibrated mm -hmm. uh, for a different term. Something I wanted to point out was uh, an idea that I'd heard from uh, some young people because of that with all these challenges in the ways they're going back to school, apart from screen, remote learning and screen time and all the other things that are changing, children's opportunity to serve and to be mm. to, to contribute to their community has also become challenging, right? Because where they would have volunteered, all those things are no longer really accessible to them. But the screen actually offers a different opportunity. Maybe they can read to some seniors via Zoom in a, in a nursing home and bring some joy yeah. to a different space in that way. Um, and I think giving them the opportunity to help and, and be you know, helpful in, in this time and in this way helps also with their emotional stability. So I'm thinking as, as we're going through this, being creative in how we solve for the things that we used to do in the past uh, would be great. And these young people are just so amazing in the things that they can do um, through their screens and their phones. So encouraging that, yeah. aspect, I think, would be a great thing to encourage in this time. You're exactly right. There are, there are volunteer opportunities out there from, you know, the, the food banks, which have become an incredible need during this time, the pandemic. Mm -hmm are still you know, looking for um, in-person volunteers and, and put a lot of safety measures in place so that that's an opportunity. And then there are different um, you know, virtual from home volunteer opportunities, like you know, different phone banks and stuff um, to help guide people to the right resources. Um, and those are things that too, you know, if, um, 
teens, you ask pediatricians about what the opportunities are, we can sort of steer them in the right direction for where they can find those volunteer opportunities. Um, as Dr. Ovi mentioned before, one of the greatest lessons we can teach right now is that when we follow all these guidelines around social distancing and mask wearing, we're taking care of our community. So this is a chance for us to, to teach that lesson um, to teenagers about the importance of taking care of each other um, by following these guidelines. Nice. Dr. Um, can we share some of your final thoughts as we're beginning to wrap up here? <laughs> oh gosh, yes, this is a crazy time. Um, but um, I think it's very important for parents to remember uh, where they need to find resources. So number one, ask your pediatrician. We are here for you. We are, we are always here for you. We are on call for you. We are available. So please reach out to us. Um, but especially with pertinence to school, um, finding the resources that you do need. So if your kid does need um, online tutoring or um, extra help with their learning, please don't hesitate to advocate for your kid's mental health as well as their um, academic health. And then of course, resources in your community, like Dr. Zakar had mentioned, um, food banks are a, a higher need right now. And some of us uh, that do um, have some food insecurity did get some of that reprieve from going to school. So making sure that um, uh, you have a food program, um, uh, some access to that would be very, very important, especially as we are adjusting to a new reality here for the school year. Awesome. Final thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. You know, please use your pediatrician, your primary care doctor as a resource. You know, when you have questions about mm -hmm. safety, about um, food security, um, no matter you know what your questions are about um, in terms of what your family's facing uniquely during this pandemic, um, your, your doctor is gonna be a resource for things that you might not realize that they can be a resource for. So please reach out to us. Um, I also wanna highlight there's um, an organization that another organization that I serve on the board of um, Call Within Reach that runs a hotline for families when they're trying to find services they may need in the community. And um, you know that that's whether there's you know housing insecurity, food insecurity, transportation security, whatever it may be that you might need help with, um, they run a hotline that you can reach out to. And, and um, the the website is parenthelp123.org. So that's how um, families can access it um, to learn more about how to reach out for resources. Awesome. I think we got one last question that came in under the wire, um, and it came from a teacher. If we can touch on it right, right quickly. Um, it says, as a teacher, I'm wondering if there are specific targets in public health that would make us feel more comfortable about returning to in-person school. And the, the answer to that is a long and complex one. And there are lots of metrics that are really being monitored by the Board of Education, um, public health in the state and at a county level, really looking, and, and, and it's a combination of what the, the infection rate is in the community and how it's increasing. And so those metrics vary and um, it's sort of challenging to pick out two or three of them right now. Um, but what, what I will say is that every um, school district has been really proactive in sharing with us what they're looking at and how they're concerned about those things. And so if issues that are coming up in your school district that are not clear or you're not comfortable with, please reach out to your pediatrician. We can sort of navigate that information with you and help to, um, to answer the questions if that helps. Um, Dr. Obi or Thakar, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think, like you said, transmission rates are what's going to determine when schools can open. So we might find that some parts of the country can open before other parts. We, we're not all going to be on the same schedule. And I know it's confusing because the metrics are different. You know, I think um, I've seen the White House, the CDC, the World Health Organization, each release metrics that have all been a little bit different. Um, and I definitely am a pro proponent for some of the more conservative metrics, you know, that I think we have pretty low um, transmission in the community before um, teachers can be safe going back to work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the question came up before about, you know, should families be worried about kids bringing the virus um, home from school? And, and while that's a legitimate concern, with what we've seen throughout the world in data is that it's actually more common for kids to bring the virus to school from home. Um, so it is a to protect teachers. And, and I'm glad to be hearing from one that, you know, yeah. we, that we want to make sure that you're safe when you go back to work. And to do that, community transmission needs to be lower than it is right now. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. I think um, um, Dr. Obi and Dr. Thakar, I want to thank you so much for your time. 
today. Yeah. I want to thank everyone who joined us and everyone who will join us later. Um, and let you know, as has been said earlier, that as your pediatrician and your pediatric care providers, we are part of your team to help your family stay safe and healthy. Please reach out to us. We are here and happy to partner with the school district, with um, you know, with you, and you know, just to try and get every resource that you need to make sure that your child and your family um, are safe through these challenging times. We will be okay. Take a deep breath. Um, this is new. This is exciting. Um, this is an opportunity to learn to do things differently. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Obi. Thank you, Dr. Thakar. Well, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right.